So you ready? I am ready. <clears throat> okay. Howdy. Welcome back to Dion Talk. I'm here today with my friend Tony, who is going to update us on what is going on with the midterm rental market. This is going to be a live stream where for the first five to 10 minutes, you might want to back up and watch from the beginning, uh, which means you didn't hear what I just said until later. But after we get the update on what's going on with midterm rentals, Tony and I are going to answer questions. So you'll be able to put your real estate and financial freedom questions into the live chat. So Tony, tell us a little bit about what's going on with midterm rentals. All right. Welcome all to this morning's little update. So I got this slide from uh, one of the groups, I believe the Furnish Finder group that talks everything about midterm rentals and traveling nurses. So today we're going to be talking about the slide deck that Furnish Finder put together at about 2022. So this is all numbers from 2022, not including 2023, but there is a little update about that. All right, next slide. So disclosures. So the CEO and co-founder of uh, Furnish Finder put all this together or he presented it to their investors. And this all this data is about 2022, unless they note otherwise. And also these are not my slides, just as a disclosure as well. All right. They like to say that they were cool. They were the midterm uh, rental platform before it was cool because now everybody's getting the midterm rentals. Uh, they started in 2020, uh, 2014. They launched 2016 for the Furnish Finder Marketplace. And then they launched uh, the, the platform or part of the platform key check in 2020. And then all new tenant types flooded the platform, not just traveling nurses, but many other different types. And since then, they've seen a 14x user growth. And for them, a 12x revenue growth in the past four years, because you can utilize KeyCheck as the platform for all your payments and processing everything else. And we'll go to the next slide. And all, and um, as many people understand or may not know, or they may know, that COVID accelerated midterm rental. As many short-term rentals turned into midterm rentals due to the COVID shutting down the world. And suddenly traveling medical professionals also needed a place to stay as the market switched from short-term rentals to midterm rentals in a very large scale. And also remote work became a permanent part of the tech and service workforce. So now there are many people who travel were working remotely, also known as digital nomads. And so by the numbers, just very quickly, that the, for the 2022, that millions of years users and bookings, but only about 200,000 midterm rentals properties listed. So out of the 100 million bookable nights a year and the 5.8 million total messages sent via the platform, that there's only about 200,000 midterm properties listed. So you can say that, hey, there's many people out there and as many people migrate from hotels VRBO and Airbnb to Furnish Finder, that you'll find more people using Furnish Finder as they get more value. And the, usually the cost is a little, bit, a little bit less. All right, now we're going to the next slide talking about aggregating the data. And so this is just an in depth look at how they're uh, looking at the industry and the insights according to their platform. All right. I'll go to the next slide talking about tenant lead breakdown. So there's three ways to get leads generation on Furnish Finder. First, you have direct booking message where a person who looks at a map after filtering everything, they look at all the different listings that are available according to their filters and they find somebody and they message that person individually. The next way is that there's a general housing request where someone can submit a very general housing request that may match what they are looking for. So if your property is on Furnish Finder and there's a match, you'll see that general match in your on your end as a property owner. This includes price, number of rooms, guests allowed, pets or not, and other filtered information. 
and then there's unmatched housing requests. And this is very negotiable. There is a pile of unmatched housing requests, basically where someone makes a general request, but it does not match with you as a property owner. There's differences on prices, number of rooms, pets, et cetera. And so like you can sort of filter out too, like if you want to message that person individually, which you can actually. So like any of these, you can message back and or go to that pile, see that notification and message that person in, individually. And so there's room negotiation on all three of those. And now let's get to the numbers. Up to this point, it's been very general information to include if you've never used Furnish Finder before. All right. Now we'll, from here, we'll, we'll specifically talk about uh, the Seattle and Washington state because that's the market that we're in and that we operate in as well. So the tenant demand breakdown, overall medical versus non-medical. As you can see from this pie chart that there's an overwhelmingly more non-medical travelers than medical travelers in the midterm space. But if we're gonna break it down in, even more, there's much more medical travelers than any other subgroup. Now with the not notable non-medical traveler types, this includes insurance housing. So displaced people due to fire, water, or other damage according to, to their house or apartment building. We have digital nomads, remote workers. And before COVID, there was corporate housing that was the most common type of housing previously. So if you're a blue collar worker in your construction site and you jump to construction site according to the seasons, you might stay at a place for a couple of months. And there was a large footprint of medical workers before, but not as much. Uh, athletes, we've seen requests uh, to house, like say locally, the Tacoma Rainiers, where they're looking to house the, the families or the individual athletes for a midterm rental during the summer cycle that they're playing for their uh, baseball league, those athletes. And then also you have re relocating families and military housing. I sort of lump those two together because you do have a lot of families, at, especially for myself, since I am near uh, the big army based that is in the South Puget Sound, JBLM, you have a lot of people relocating from say, California to Washington State, or people PCSing or permanent change of duty station from Hawaii to Washington, or they're moving from Washington to another location. I get those requests all the time, and I do house those type of people as well. Now we go to the next slide, talking about demand insights. Now there were over 18 million map searches. So this could be anybody. And this is what I say, I anybody. As myself, as an investor, sometimes I want to see what the demand is and or supply of my competitors in the area. So I'll go to Furnish Finder, I'll put in a filter to sort of match what I have and then see what everybody else has. That counts as a map search. So I wouldn't, and you could do that multiple times. So there's over 18 million map searches. So both investors and people looking for properties do map searches. And we'll talk about it a little bit later, like what the actual demand is. And that will be booking requests. That will be the, the metric that you want to look at in terms of like what the actual demand is in your area. But to also talk about the most searched cities, we have the top 10 here. And number two is the Seattle, which I sort of lump Tacoma, Puyallup, and Olympia also within that, the South Puget Sound area. All right, now we go to the next slide. States with the highest demand. And Washington State had the third highest booking requests. As we talked about, booking requests is a better metric on what the demand is. And Washington State, we had over 65 booking requests. All right. And so the states with the highest supply, Washington State was number five. And so we have about 6,000 properties, more or less, here in Washington State. And compare this to the previous slide, which had over 65 booking requests. So you could say over a 12-month period, that is about 5,416 booking requests per month. But travel is seasonal. So you're going to have more booking requests up here in the Washington State, in the Pacific Northwest, in the summertime, because everybody's mark 
migrates up here because it's beautiful. You don't have the rain going on and it's just absolutely stunning up here. People love to go hiking and doing all sorts of things outdoors. Or out of the 65,000 requests, there's about 11 requests per one unit of all the state of Washington, if we're taking all of the state of Washington holistically, because you might have travelers going out to eastern Washington out on the desert side, or they might be up in Everett, uh, which also has hospital systems, or in Silverdale, or in Bremerton, which are other hospital systems as well. All right, now we're going to go to overlap and opportunity, the top three. Washington state is not in here. But you do have other states such as Florida, Arizona, and California, which they have a 14 to 1, 13 to 1, and 12 to 1, which I've already talked about. The little bit of math, Washington State has about 11 to 1. Booking requests to the number of properties. All right, now we're going to talk about demand and show the top demand for the top cities. Seattle is number two for the number of demand, both in map searches and booking requests. And here's a second slide for the top demand of the other five. And then top cities by inventory. Fortunately, or fortunately, Seattle is not in the top five for cities, but it is in the top 10 as number six for supply for inventory. All right, now we're gonna talk about overlap and opportunity within the top cities for both supply and demand. As you can see here, there's both high demand and high supply for Seattle. But if you're looking at doing maybe out of town investing, you probably wanna look in this left-handed common with high demand and rising supply. So that means that there is not enough supply to meet demand. So Portland, San Francisco, Nashville, Albuquerque, and Boston. But knowing what the prices are in San Francisco, probably not there. Portland, Nashville, and Albuquerque are probably your better bets if you're looking for out-of-state investing. But I'm not a, uh, a person that would knows those markets, so I would say do your own research in those areas. All right. Now we have the top cities, 11 through 40. And seeing that we're both in the Pacific Northwest, you have Tacoma as number 17 for demand. And then if we're talking about inventory, Tacoma by inventory is number 37, 37 in this. So bottom line, Tacoma has much more supply than demand overall. All right, now we're gonna talk about growing markets based on the booking requests. Washington State, I, from my own analysis, none of these cities from Washington State were in here. So in terms of like sales price, you might be able to find a better value here in Washington State, say, than like Irvine, California, or Cal somewhere in Hawaii, where prices are around $1.3 million. You might want to be one of these other cities, which is around $100,000. All this price data is from Redfin. All right. Now you're going to look at demand split by size. So I had a question about this. What is the Gucci effect? So according to Urban Dictionary, because everybody knows that Urban Dictionary is the foremost uh, place you can find anything, uh, new definitions. So the Gucci effect is the price if something rises, there is more demand for it because it is considered the best. So larger properties experience the Gucci effect because now people see a three or four bedroom house available. And if you're traveling in a group because you do have families who travel, midterm rentals, so like relocating families and insurance, and also traveling nurses sometimes travel with their families, homeschooled, and or uh, friends who are traveling together, like or traveling couples. They're looking for those three and four bedroom properties. And so you can almost raise your price on those properties even further, and you'll get a higher price point. But there's less of those people, so there's less inventory for that on the, on the same side. But the most demanded request is for one bedroom because most travelers are traveling by themselves. But more people want larger homes, so you can have the Gucci effect as well. That's right. 
inventory split by size. And these are the top five states, which we already talked about, including Washington, follows this trend for inventory split by size. All right, now we're gonna talk about the overlap for opportunity by inventory size. There are overall more larger properties, so it's harder to book because that of the effect of people looking for a one bedroom compared to a three or four bedroom. As you can see here, there's much more inventory for that. And there's more whole houses moving from midterm rental to short term rental due to regulation. Looking at Vegas and Dallas, they just passed a lot of regulation saying you cannot have short term rentals unless you already have a license. So a lot more people are moving to short to midterm rentals. So there's going to be much more competition. And as we can tell in this chart, there's infinitely more demand for studios than any other unit. And most traveling nurses are single females, not traveling with a pet. So studio is fine for them. And they're looking for the best value at that point. So it depends upon what your client target clientele. For myself, for my units, I have learned my niche is traveling couples with pets. And we'll talk about that a little bit too, especially the pets part. All right, budget size and budget split by demand. This chart shows the, what people are requesting on their booking request by budget. So they're look, gonna be looking at something that is less than what maybe the market shows, or they're moving from a, liar, uh, a lower price point area to a higher price point area. So basically their expectations have not met reality yet. So like people moving say from Kentucky to Washington state, Prices are probably three to four times much more in terms of housing costs than where they're from. And so their expectations have not been met yet in terms of that. And as we talked about in the previous uh, video, Dion and I, we talked about gsa.gov and how by zip code and by area, you can find what the per diem is for that area. And so that's what the traveling nurses may find to be the higher uh, housing cost, but also the housing, their stipend reaches, meets that. And you can see here, most budgets are within the 16 to 24 budget range, about 31.5%, and then below the $1,200 range at 24.2%. I can tell you that almost nobody has, at least up here in the Tacoma, Seattle area, you cannot hardly find a studio below $1,200. So you're going to have the expected narrowing with increase in bedroom costs and negotiations occur at that price point. All right, we're going to talk about the next slide. Budget split by inventory. As you can see here, the overwhelming majority of properties are between the $16 and $2,400 price range at 27.7%. And then the other is over $2,800, $2,800. And that is that a full quarter of all available properties. So this is where this you're going to have that uh, price points and negotiations between the travelers and the landlords. And so if you have a property and it looks like the sweet spot is between that $1,600 and $2,400, $2,400 as there's much more parity there. So your bookings are going to be much more consistent and you'll have much more people there compared to probably like if you're above $2,800. All right, now we're going to talk about the overlap and opportunity. And so we already gave a brief analysis of the overlap, but according to Furnish Finder, they're seeing much more demand for higher priced properties, talking about the Gucci effect, right? and especially for larger homes, especially if it's cute and you allow pets, which we'll talk about very, very soon. All right, now we're gonna talk about demand by lead time. So 39% of lead time of 15 days or less. And if you include anything under 30 days or less, you're gonna see that most booking requests are, so you have about over, just over 200,000 for seven days or less. And then eight to 15 days or less is just under 200,000. And then 16 to 30 days is about 300,000. So 400,000 plus 300,000, 
total of like 700,000 requests are coming in 30 days or less. And less than 15% of people are planning more than 60 days. And so you want to do really close calendar, calendar tracking, high response rate, and be flexible of what you have. And I've noticed as a landlord that most requests for traveling nurses, especially, come in right before the first or the 15th of the month, because that's when the contracts are starting in the, in the mid and beginning of the month. So what about pets? Well, if you've listened to Dion at any rate of time, you know that he allows pets in his properties. I allow my pets in my properties. And you can see here, traveling with pets and then pets allowed, that there is an 8.1% difference between demand and supply, or there's more travelers traveling with pets than units not allowing pets. So bottom line, if you want higher bookings and you want to demand higher prices for units, allow pets. Because, and this is a really interesting statistic as well, just within Washington State, millennials, my age range, there's more millennials with pets than kids. So people travel with their pets, you allow pets, you're going to find more consistent bookings and higher price bookings because you're allowing pets. Because most hotels, they do allow pets, but there's breed restrictions. You have weight restrictions and number of pet restrictions. And I've looked at the local hotels in my area. You might be able to get a place for $90 a night. But if you have a pet that costs $45 a night per pet, so you're going to be increasing your costs which way more if you're allowing if you're in a hotel, if you're looking to book in hotels. All right, next slide. Observations of best practices. So there's a wide variety of travelers and demand that fits all budgets, property types, and locations. Photos make the largest impression than editor before. So get very good photographer or get very good at taking photos yourself and Photoshopping those. Well, not Photoshopping, but filtering those. Makes them look sparkle and span. Amenities are in high demand. So in-unit laundry, free parking, as we talked about thoughtful furnishings, secured entry, being in secure neighborhoods, et cetera. Tenants are looking for fast and efficient replies and future available set in your calendar and respond quickly to direct messages. And many travelers are looking to travel with pets, which we've already spoken about. And here's some other stats that they talk about key check, their payment system that uh, many do prefer to try to pay with ACH or their credit card, which key check allows. And also if you pay for it, you can get state specific e-signed edit edible custom leases that you can do as well. And you can also have the renters upload their renters insurance and do security deposits that way. And so that has been the trends for 2023, as we've already talked about, and as more competition, so it, and more people are coming to Furnish Finder and has exploded in the past three years. So you really want to make your property stand out and have really good service and just ensure that you're uh, keeping on top of things. And so now we come to the portion where if you have questions about midterm rentals, we could talk about it. I am more attuned to what is happening within Washington State. So if you have Washington State specific questions, I can help answer those or in general. Um, if you're asking about your own particular market, I don't know other markets. So uh, find somebody in your own area in your own real estate network that does midterm rentals, ask them questions, and I'm pretty sure they will hook you up and talk to you about this type of things. So I will stop sharing my screen now. Awesome, thank you for doing that. So uh, kind of eye-opening there, almost everyone that I know when they talk midterm rentals, they talk traveling nurses. So it's the largest single group of renters, right? Yep, but it's less than half of the people who do short-term, you know, midterm rentals. I I I think that there's kind of a missed opportunity there where a lot of people think I need to reach out to the hospital, I need to get on the list for traveling nurses instead of getting on Furnished Finder and any other sites where you can post for obviously more than half of the people who rent midterm rentals aren't tra traveling nurses. Uh the other thing to really take away from that is legislation can change at any time. 
And <laughs> imagine Absolutely. if you purchased a place where you had to have short-term rental income for the property to make sense. And all of a sudden Dallas says, not here. Can't do it here. Nope. So can you now sell it to people who know they're limited to midterm or long-term or living on properties? Uh, that's a, It's kind of a big risk with short-term. It's one of those things where I've talked about often, purchase a property that makes sense as a long-term rental, benefit from it while you can as a short-term rental. And if it ever goes away, at least you're not like out-of-pocket money, losing money every month. So we're going to give a few minutes for people to get questions into the comment on short-term rentals. I do see one here from Amafid. So howdy, Amafid. Uh, is there a need on Furnished Finder for midterm rentals by the room? Because I didn't see that breakdown either. I saw one room, two room, three room. Um, I have a friend who does uh, midterm rentals, traveling. He calls it traveling nurses because so far that's all he's had was nurses. And it's he's got his house is set up with two master suites. So one of the masters, it's basically by the room. So I know that there are people who do it. I don't know if there's demand for it. So I would say that's where it's sort of the in-between between studio and by room. Um, I believe on Furnish Finder, you can filter by mm -hmm. room. And so there is filters where you can get uh, properties that allow by the room. And there is a demand for it. Now, it depends upon... Um, it is what it is in many cases, like most traveling nurses are females. And if you're a male renting out your own house and you live in the house, they may not want to be with a male that owns the house. So like you might have that type of discrimination just because like they're traveling females, they don't know if they feel safe with that individual, right? Um, but if you're a female that owns a house and you're a traveling nurse that is looking for a room by the house and you have your travel with your pet and the owner at home's a pet, like that makes it a match made in heaven. They're looking at saving their cost. They don't mind living with other people or sharing a space. And that's sort of like where it comes down to individual preference too. Like, and like I said, it depends upon whom you are targeting. So yes, there is a demand for it. Yes, you might have bookings if you're a, a single male just know that they may not feel as safe unless you have other safeguards like, hey, I'm only home at this time and I have security cameras in the shared spaces and also outside the property. And these other type of considerations you might have to look at as a single man. Or if you're a couple that owns the property and you're, look and you're okay with sharing your space, that they'll feel a lot more comfortable because now it's a husband wife, right? Um, and so like those type of considerations do taken apart, but there is a demand, but also know that's probably the most common type of thing. The one bedroom shared living spaces is the most common. So how do you stand out from that? Allowing pets, having no security cameras outside, having a yard, being a very close proximity to those medical facilities and or location where they're working. If you, they can walk, even the best thing, right? Washington State, we have a lot of rain, so maybe they don't want to walk. And so, like, and also the parking piece, too. So, like, there is demand, but also know, look at those different types of considerations. I saw in there that photos have the biggest impact on people looking for places. What other things have you done with your midterm rentals to make them stand out? So, for myself, I've mostly rented on... Uh, Airbnb for my midterms. And so I've learned to sort of jailbreak the algorithm in a way because they want on Airbnb to provide experiences now. So like I have paddle boards, I have kayaks, I have bikes. And I put those pictures on there and I make sure I check mark those. And I'm thinking about adding game boards, which I can go to Goodwill, get a couple of game boards, check that mark off. Maybe getting a emulator console system saying I have arcade games there. It's sort of like those type of things and adding it to your listing makes it stand out a little more and have those pictures on there. It's like, yes, I have game boards or board games. Sorry. I have these bikes, paddle boards so that they have the option to utilize those. Like my properties are just within a block of a lake. I don't have like directly on the lake, but I'm act like access, like putting that in the title 
or within the first couple of lines and having a picture about that will demonstrate that difference between just a regular house and a regular neighborhood that has nothing, does not allow pets, has a very small yard. Like showcasing what you have and going a little bit further, spending a little bit, a couple hundred dollars, just go to OfferUp or Facebook Marketplace, get that item, bring it to your property, put it on there. It makes a world of a difference of either the algorithm or the picture you have set up. And knowing how to do that makes your bookings consistent and um, have higher quality tenants as well. And you told me the other day we met at the Tacoma FI meetup, uh, you have the kayaks and stuff on your listing. How many of your tenants that you've had actually have taken those things and used them, even though that's the thing that attracted them to it? I've only had one couple use the kayak or the paddleboard in the whole year and a half I've had these units up. So just the idea that they could is what it takes. More Absolutely. so than all of the wear and tear people are expecting on items like that. I, I stayed at Beth Traverso's cabin um, and she has the emulator arcade game thing set up there. And there's a uh, detached garage that's set up kind of like a gaming room. Uh, so I think that would, you know, photos of that would help too. Uh, there was another thought that I was thinking of the other day, comparing because I do all long term, right? So, super lazy, super boring to me. Boring is sexy. I've come close to to thinking about doing short or mid term rental. Uh, I had a I have a house with a duplex, right? And so it's separated, so I don't have long term tenants next to a revolving door type tenancy. I, yep. I was going to do the house, but those tenants asked for the rent to go up so much that I didn't want them to leave which is actually a thing people tenants ask you for the rent to go up. Yes. Um, and in my mind, I always assumed midterm rentals would be less work than short-term rentals for the owner. But having talked now to some people like you and Matt here from Washington, uh, it seems like the short-term rental platform, while it's a lot more texting and messages, is less work than midterm. Because with short term, you're not looking at credit scores, eviction records, employment history. You just have a listed price. Do they agree to it? They ask you some questions about the unit. You pay a cleaning company. You don't, you know, you know that most of the owners aren't the ones going out there and spending an afternoon cleaning between tenants because unless they want the extra money for the cleaning fee that they get to charge. Versus midterm, the reason places like Hawaii, Vegas, Dallas don't ban midterm is because they're tenants. You're signing exactly. a lease for a shorter period of time, but it's still over 30 days in most cases. Um, what is your opinion? Do you think your workload would go down or up if you went from the midterm to short term? If I was to go to midterm from from midterm to short term exclusively, I would be forced to put systems in place to ensure that I'm doing less work. Because when I do occasionally switch from midterm to short term to cover some space in between the longer term bookings, like my anxiety levels go up because then I'm like, I don't know who's going to be in there. And I'm the one doing the, the bookings and I'm the one communicating with my cleaner like, hey, this is the next time that the person's coming in. Can you come in unless they have like other persons um, because I'm at my cleaners, primarily single moms and they're this is their site, their business. They're trying to make things happen. And so like, I don't have systems in place to do that. Now, if I was going to short-term rentals exclusively, I would automatically make everything as systematic as possible. So do I have to deal with it? Um, now there is more work right now because I am doing a lot more managing myself so I can pocket more of my money that way. And it, to me, the cost benefit analysis is that I'm okay with doing more messaging doing occasional, uh, I guess not programming, but uh, coordination to get my cleaner in there every couple of months. Like it's a cycle because like there's a couple of months where I'm not doing anything. I'm just like seeing on my security cameras. Oh, they did this. Okay, whatever. And then I just delete the recording. And then, but by the time that I don't have anybody in my unit because I'm the one booking everything, or making sure that things are going flowing is dependent upon me. Like, hey, I'm the one that needs to 
start making sure that my calendar is up to date, that my prices are okay according to the season and demand, and that now I'm the one messaging all these people and going to all these Facebook groups because I'm the one marketing at all these different Facebook groups. There's like 15 different ones that have tens to hundreds of thousands of traveling nurses and others in them. And I'm the one posting, reposting, and cross-posting, making sure that everything is correct in that uh, posting with the pictures. And then I'm the one answering email, uh, direct messages and comments and such. So like there is more work because I'm doing more myself. And you're correct. Like, if it'll go to short term rental, I would automatically try to systematic, make everything systematic as possible so that I don't have to deal with it. So, I think that most of us become comfortable with a certain um, lifestyle. So, you are comfortable with midterm. You have your cleaner, which is occasional. You use the term occasional every few months when there's a turnover. Yep. With, with long term, um, I, I prefer when possible to your leases. So the, the amount of work that needs to go into me is when I buy a property and I'm going to put a tenant in place, I have to do a rent box study, which takes about two weeks. So it's a significant amount of time to because I haven't looked at rents in an area for a while. If I have a tenant turnover, I have to study the market again. If I'm coming up on a lease, new, lease renewal most years for a decade, I would do 5% rent increase every other year, right? So 2.5% increase a year, but the change was every two years. But I had to pay attention to things like when we had 2020, 2021, we had the pandemic eviction moratorium, rent spiked 30 to 40%. I did the binder strategy with all existing tenants. So I had to do that work over a decade. And I do the binder yeah. when I first meet tenants, if, if I'm purchasing a property where they live, or when there's a black swan event. So my level of work needed is, is very minimal. Every couple of years, maybe, or, or the, the, the black swan thing was in a decade versus med, midterm. And then you said, if I went short term, I would systematize everything. I would get everything as, as, as automated as possible. So my brain says, if I went midterm, I would go as automated as possible to try to keep it as close as to hands off as, as I am where I'm at now. Uh, and, I, and I think there are short term people who look at, well, I have short term property management and I have a cleaning crew that's dispatched with them. So I'm not hands on at all. I never meet the tenants. I never screen the tenants. I never have to interact with anything by like making a decision to whether that should be the, the tenant in my property or not, because short term is the easiest for them. They would think it's crazy to look at midterm or long term because we might have to deal with evictions where yep. short term has the protection of the short term platform on there. So when people are choosing what to invest in, their end goal, their bandwidth for how much work they want to put into it. And usually what they're anchored to and the first time they heard information on this is how rental works. You should have property management. You should, um, which one makes the most amount of money. Uh, it's really hard to change once your systems are going. Uh, so I'm hoping people educate themselves before they make big commitments, like in Dallas, buying a property that only made sense as a short-term rental. And now they're stuck. Absolutely. And they don't know how to pivot because they've never been in that situation. And that's where you're looking at the market. And then it's like, okay, what is the best value I can get out of that? The best value was short-term rental. And that has a very high value. But does the money work for a mid-term rental and a, a long-term rental? And if it doesn't, then you're in a very much in a pickle. Or if you can look at maybe doing sober living or long-term healthcare, does the property able to meet those type of requirements that you can do either sober living and or uh, long-term health care for elderly people. So with your midterm rentals, I'm going to put you on the spot because um, often we will try to answer questions that come into the comments, but we're waiting for that. Mm -hmm. um, what is the biggest mistake you made with your midterm rental business? Ooh. I don't know if I've, I would consider it a mistake so far. Um, when I did shift it from midterm to short term for a little bit, like I did accept a person that I had really bad vibes about, but I was like, I like the money. Okay, I'll accept it. And the dude did weird things to it. It was very, very strange. And my cleaner was just like sort of freaked out about it too. And uh, yeah, 
very, very bad vibes and um, didn't destroy it, but definitely left a huge weird mess. Just like some sort of weird powder everywhere. And they did, I don't know what's going on. And like, just looking for, I guess the mistake there is that I wanted to alleviate my anxiety of not getting money at that time period. Like it was in the off season. So like in February up here and I accepted that person. I probably should have just like, you know, no, you're not coming to stay here. And I was like, yep, not going to do that again. It's like, they're giving me bad vibes. I'm going to do everything in my possible power to say them, cancel the reservation, go on and do their own thing. Can you pinpoint anything you think that that told you, hey, there's a red flag here? Uh, the messaging, like, and the pictures. So, like, even profile pictures that you have up for, on, say, VRBO, Airbnb, or if you have one on Furnished Finder, have a good, nice picture up there. Just not some weird, like, flip flown picture up there. You're just like, this guy sort of looks weirded out. And then the messaging, like, it was just huge wall of text. And this guy you could sell had some sort of weird train of thought. It wasn't broken down between different paragraphs, with like spaces in between. It wasn't like grammatically correct. And I was just like, this guy is sort of, I could tell his, his, menta- his mentality and emotional stability was not there. And then for days afterwards, like he wanted to call me directly. And he did after the booking, you could see each other's phone numbers. So like he messaged me and called me for a couple of days afterwards and this guy would just would not shut up and it was just like had all these life issues i'm like dude like you're a veteran you have some sort of things going on i feel for you but go to the va there's lots of other programs out there i am not that like i am just your one night landlord and you did weird things to my property and now you want to like offload all your issues on me like yes i'm a veteran too i have soldiers who've had ptsd who've been blown up and all these things, I've taken on that load myself to help you. But I'm your landlord for one night. Like, go get help that you need. Like, it was just very weird. For yeah, the communication aspect is huge. Uh, a lot of people will talk about, and you see a lot of videos on how do you choose an agent? How do you choose a lender? Well, response time was important. I mean, right now, I've shifted my strategy to watching days on market. The longer something sits on market, the more likely a lower offer is to be accepted, right? But for the last three to five years, Speed was our friend. We wanted to get an offer with a pre-approved letter within an hour of finding a posting, right? So speed mattered. So when we're vetting agents and lenders, we'll look at the communication. When did I send my email? Was their response in the same format or did they text me so that it's not a chain now or however we think of it? And we'll pick and choose that. But I very rarely hear owners talking about when I first started communicating with the tenant. Here's how the communication was. And and that is something to really pay attention to. How responsive are they? I'm understanding when I realize, okay, a tenant, because I do long-term rentals, they're looking at 30 places for rent, right? They're sending several things. So they will ask things like, can you remind me what property this is? That's not a red flag to me if they have to have that clarification. But random emotional life unloading in any situation where it's going to be tenant that's an early red flag. You you don't want to be the landlord therapist, right? No. Any more than we are probably already going to be anyway with regular tenants that don't have issues. Um, I, ha- I have one who reached out. Um, I have a roommate. My roommate has a dog. Can you send us a letter saying we're not allowed to have pets? I'd be absolutely fine doing that, except you have a pet too, right? So I'm not I'm not <laughs> the therapist in this situation. Uh, And that's regular tenants that don't have other issues. So you started, when we first met, you had a different opinion of investing. Absolutely. Let's let's cover a little bit of that that timeline shift here without disparaging any asset class, because there are people who invest successfully in every asset class and people who don't in some. There are people who fail at real estate. It's entirely possible to lose money by not educating and making bad choices and having bad debt structure and making assumptions about rents going up in the future and interest rates going down in the future that can just blow up in, a, in an investor's face. What did you invest in when we first met? Oh, I was wholly into um, both stocks and then crypto. Okay. 
Uh, how did your stock investing go? Uh, a lot of it went down. And my crypto, <laughs> a lot of those companies went under. And so you pivoted to real estate. Anything anything that you would have done different with your, your real estate launch? Uh, in the timeline that I did it, I don't think so. Um, except maybe thinking bigger at the time. Um, but I saw an opportunity for what I wanted in my buy box when I sold the duplex. And I was like, this is what I want to get. Um, this is what I'm going to do right now. And I did it and executed um, very clearly. And then also maybe listening to my real estate agent. So when we were shopping for lenders, I decided to go with my bank and they had the lowest interest rate out of everybody else. And my real estate agent's like, you will get that best rate. But I've worked with them before. They are not very easy to work with because they demand so many documents. They're always late and closing. And we did have to shift. They were very difficult to deal with. They were late on the closing. So we had to shift the date again. And it only had to almost had to shift the date again because they wanted more documents and they weren't ready on their end. And I threatened them, I will pull my application with you unless you get this done by the closing date. And miraculously, they did it. Like magically, they did it. Um, so that would be probably maybe two things, like maybe thinking a little bit bigger, but I saw what I was looking for and executed on it. And I'm doing very well with it. And then like listening to my agent who's been in the business, who knew this lender, and we got it done, but it was painful. Yeah, people have a finite reputation in this industry. There's, there's only so many lenders, so many agents, uh, and you're going to have a reputation that lasts decades. So if a lender, if an agent has worked in an area for a while and they make a lender recommendation, um, it's, I'm not saying pounce on it, and go for it. It might be their cousin and they're going to get a kickback, right? But I'm just saying, listen, what is their reasoning for not liking a certain lender? Uh I had actually experience recently my first cash purchase and I've done several, you know, seven properties with purchased regular loans. Right. So you remember what your loan signing was like? I do. This is, yeah. the, this is how thick the paperwork is when you don't have a mortgage. That's it. It's like five pages. Nice. Um, so most of the problems that come up during the process of buying a property are lender problems. Mm -hmm. Underwriting needs to verify something. They need to, whatever they're trying to do that can extend those dates like that, those can cause a big problem. And so going with uh, a good lender who understands speed, response time, all, all of that matters. Oh, absolutely. And because it was a VA loan, which I've used my VA loan twice, you can use your VA loan multiple times. It just depends upon the algorithm of utilizing the benefits if you're going to switch from one to the other. And you might have to refinance to get out of one loan to the another um, if you're going to utilize a VA loan, which has a lot more stringent standards as well. So like you, when you're looking at properties utilizing, say, an FHA or a VA loan, you do have to keep those standards in mind when you're looking at a property. It basically has to be move-in ready at that time. And yeah, there's there's some other hoops to jump through with those uh, that, that actually make a conventional owner-occupied loan sometimes more attractive to the seller, right? It's not so much the pay, the hoops you have to jump through. It's when the seller's sitting back and they have two almost identical offers. One is VA, one is conventional. The perception, whether it's real or not, is VA is harder to deal with. So they'll go conventional. Mm -hmm. uh, same with FHA. So if a person has a choice and can choose to go, I've, I've gone conventional. I've not used my VA loan. I, I don't want to do FHA. FHA is not for first-time home buyers. It is for people with bad credit and bad debt-to-income ratios. VA is a pretty good option, and you you would hope to find people that would go. Oh, I'm not going to penalize a veteran for trying to use a veteran product, but that's not how the person who isn't publicly talking about their decision-making process is going to think. Yep, absolutely. Legacy OPP. I'm on a workcation for a tenant turnover with my. With what I've learned from you, everything went great. Awesome. Congratulations. 
Um, the wealth building journey says that's a form of love bombing. Be wary of others who overshare in an emotional state. That's actually one of the things we used to eliminate candidates during an interview process. They overshare during the interview and, and in view, interviewers will use silence as a tool. Ask a question, get an answer, and then they sit there quietly. People don't like silence. And so the interviewee will fill that. And if it becomes an emotional thing, it can get you eliminated. Um, okay, any other questions for about midterm rentals? We'll probably be wrapping this up in a few minutes. Tony, I want to thank you for sharing that, doing that midterm rental update. I think it's a pretty good strategy. I, I, I haven't heard of too many areas. I actually haven't heard of. I could probably look up any areas that have not allowed midterm rentals. I know Hawaii went to 90 day. Uh, Dallas, and you said, I think Vegas. I hadn't heard that. So Vegas yep. is one to add to the list is eliminating short term rentals. Um, a lot of HOAs and municipalities are fighting it. There are uh, hotel chains spending billions of dollars in lawsuits trying to stop short-term rentals, but the war is not hitting midterm rentals the same. So there no. is another option. Um, does and, make more money than long-term. Go ahead. Oh, absolutely. And one thing I, I did just remind, you reminded me, I did see an article how many hotel chains like the Hilton and Hyatt, they're actually going... They're actually looking at getting into the midterm rental space. How they're doing that is basically copying what Extended Stay is doing, doing all these kitchenettes in unit laundry, but in a larger, much larger scale. Now, of course, that's going to take anywhere from three to 10 years for, the, for them to fully build out the strategy of where they want to build these type of properties and the construction process, the permitting process, and everything like that. But I did see an article where major hotel chains are looking to get in midterm rentals. So I stayed in Portugal for a month and a half, and I was only doing four or five days in each town. I was all along the Algarve on the southern edge. And something that they've done there for, I believe, decades, because I wasn't there before, but these seem to have be, been in place for a long time, is the hotels are apartments. Mm -hmm. They're, like you said, kitchenettes, full laundry, uh, meant for longer term stays. So I could I could see that, you know, once it's in place and they go through the expense of making it that way, it's viable. Um, so midterm seems to have support. There's a question here from Dividend Dave. What's the overall midterm rental market like compared to short term? From my understanding, overall, if we're looking at the entire United States, um, Airbnb did come out uh, during their earnings call uh, last quarter. Um, that they did see a drop in terms of overall bookings and prices have gone down. And if we're like taking, say, Phoenix, Arizona and Tempe, which had the uh, Super Bowl there, everybody knew the Super Bowl was going to be there for like a whole year out, right? Everybody started buying in Phoenix, Arizona. And so like a, a year ago, you can make a killing as a short-term rental on VRBO or Airbnb, having your property up in just some regular house, some regular neighborhood. But because investors flooded the market and put their properties up on Airbnb and VRBO, overall bookings went down and price points went down. So like we see that with the market, especially with the recessionary period. And as the US dollar has gone up in value, I mean, these are like macroeconomic type of situation too, because less people are traveling internationally, less people are traveling long distance during a recessionary per period. People travel local. They're looking for best value. And midterm rentals has gone up over time because Airbnb has also seen this transition as well from short-term stays to longer-term stays, because we talked about that at the very beginning. More traveling nurses, more people traveling midterm, more digital nomads. There's a book out by Bigger Pockets talking about the digital nomad, um, talking all about midterm rentals and about those changes too. So there's more midterm, there's less short-term. So that's why you see these shifts in the market and these big power players making these moves as well. Nice. Well, thanks, Tony. I appreciate that. Um, I will pin a comment after this video is done being live with your contact info. So if anybody has any questions, they want to reach out and ask you about midterms um, or about uh, 
your experiences in the military. Yeah, there, <laughs> there too. <laughs> uh, I want to wrap up with correcting my uh, gap in knowledge. Uh, thanks, Mark. Mark Oshiro is the financial firefighter who lives in Hawaii. And I've heard for a long time that they were trying to ban short-term rentals up to 90 days. Uh, Mark is saying, uh, so updating my knowledge gap again, that uh, the courts overruled it. And so now it's still limited, like in Dallas, to uh, no short term of 30 days or less. Um, and just like in Dallas, if you already have a, a license or if you're in certain areas for high tourist stuff, you can still do it. But there is a, a, an, a, a I want to say an army, but a lot of people, a lot of corporations fighting to stop short term rentals. And so it's, it's a, it's an, it's an investment strategy that I would be cautious if it had to be short term to make money, I would, I would reconsider uh, what you're doing there. So thanks, Tony. Appreciate you taking the time out. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you all for being here until my next video. Thanks for coming to my Dion talk.